One of the most uh, wonderful words, I think, in the Bible is reconciliation. Reconciliation kind of warms your heart, gives us a reason to rejoice. Uh, Maybe you've been reconciled to someone or you've known someone that was reconciled. Maybe it was two former good friends who have now been enemies for years. But they were reconciled and now their friendship has been renewed. Maybe it was a father and son who hadn't spoken in years, being brought back together as a family. They were reconciled. Or possibly a husband and wife who had been separated for a long time, being reconciled as God intended. We can probably all think about Uh, examples or experiences of two people being reconciled. And and it's always a time of happiness. Our text this morning is about being reconciled. And it's the greatest reconciliation of all because it's man being reconciled to God. Our text comes from Colossians chapter 1. And in particular, the verses 19 through 23. Reconciliation. I want us to think about how joyous those occasions are. So let's read verses 19 19 through 23. For it pleased the Father that in Him, Christ, all the fullness should dwell. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you, who once were alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister." Our theme this morning is the fact that Jesus is the only one capable of reconciling man to God. The first thing we note here in this paragraph, in this text, is the need for reconciliation. Verse 21 says that at one time we were alienated and enemies in our mind by wicked works. Sin is what alienates a person from God. Nothing else does. It is sin. The prophet Isaiah, toward the end of his book, his letter, writes this in Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, and let's read the first two verses. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah writes, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. What separated them? Their iniquities, their transgressions, their sins. That's how man becomes separated from God. That's what does it. It's sin. It's iniquity. So that causes us to fall out of fellowship with God. Causes us to lose peace with God. Causes us to become enemies of God. Causes us to be against God. To oppose Him. So when we live in sin, we are opposing God. And we are now out of fellowship. Now we're out of reconciliation. That's a sad state. But these verses are not sad. These verses are very happy and joyful because it says, can be reconciled. We don't have to remain separated from God. We don't have to remain out of reconciliation. There is a way back. How? Christ. That's what he says. He says, by him he's able to reconcile all things to himself. See, it's Christ who has the power to do that. And why? Because he has all the attributes of God. See, it says, For it pleased the Father that in Christ all the fullness should dwell. All the fullness of deity, all the fullness of God, of the divine nature, dwells in Christ. So because of that power He has by those attributes, He has the ability to reconcile man to God. 
to bring us back into fellowship. And maybe in some of your own experiences, you have known someone that was responsible for bringing those two people back. A husband and wife, or two friends, or a father and a son. Someone was able to bring them back together. That's what Christ does and is capable of doing. Bringing us back together. Because we cannot do it ourselves. God knew that once we sinned, we couldn't be reconciled back to God on our own. We, we didn't have the power. We didn't have the ability to do that. So God took the first step. He knew we couldn't take the first step because we're powerless. So He took the first step. And that first step was sending Jesus Christ into the world. When Paul wrote the second recorded letter to the church at Corinth, he talked about this reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll begin reading in verse 18 and several of the verses following. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. Paul writes, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now there and we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God was in Christ reconciling us to him. God was in Christ. God sent God took the first step by sending Christ. I was thinking this morning as I was studying this lesson, it's like there was a great big chasm between us and God. And there was no way we could cross that. There was no way. We had no means to cross that. So what did God do? He made Jesus a bridge. Jesus was made our bridge. He bridged that gap between us and God so that now we could be reconciled to God. And I imagine Jesus on the cross being that bridge, going from one side of that great big chasm to the other so that we could be reconciled to God. We couldn't do it ourselves. So Christ on the cross... He was made a sin offering for us. That's what His death did. It paid the price for our sin. The Bible also says that His death, his death put to death the enmity that exists between man and God. When we sin, sin is what made us an enemy of God. And without the blood of Christ, there's no way to bring us back together. There's no way for us to be at peace. I could not have peace with God without the blood of Christ. That's what our text says. The end of verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Why did Jesus have to die? I couldn't be reconciled to God without it. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he said uh, a very similar thing to them in the second chapter. Notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. He says, For he himself, referring to Christ, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to you who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. It was through the cross because of what He did on the cross, by the shedding of His blood on the cross, that we can be reconciled. And there is no other way for it to be done. 
We can be friends with God again because of Christ. And notice that the reconciliation is only found in the one body. It's only found in the one body. One cannot be reconciled to God outside the body of Christ. It's not possible for you to be in fellowship with God and not be in His body, the body of Christ. He says it's not possible. Where are all the reconciled? They're in the church, the body of Christ. Nowhere else is it possible. Is the church essential? If we're going to be reconciled to God, it's essential. Because that's where it's found. That's where peace is found. Peace between God and man, where is it found? In the church. But, for this reconciliation to occur, we have to come in contact with the blood of Christ. Because he says that's what makes peace possible. That's what brings us back together. His blood. So I have to come in contact with his blood. I cannot be reconciled to God without it. So I have to come in contact. <clears throat> His blood was shed in death. Jesus on the cross, that's where His blood was shed, in His death. So if I desire peace with God, I have to contact His blood. I have to get into His body. Because that's where all the reconciled are. That's where peace is. But how does that happen? Do I just believe it's going to happen? It's not what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear about it, actually. He tells us in Romans chapter 6 where and how that occurs. And he makes it crystal clear. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His Death, but, but why is that so significant, being baptized into his death? Notice what he says in the next verse. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're buried with him <clears throat> through death. What's significant about his death? That's where his blood was shed. I come in contact with His blood when I am baptized for the forgiveness of sins. There's no other act anywhere in the Bible that says that is where we come in contact with His blood. There's no other, no other event, no other act ever mentioned or even hinted at. So without it, I can't come in contact with His blood. Blood, because his blood was shed in death. So one baptized into Christ is baptized into his death. And therefore, that blood is now available to wash away sins. And sin is the only thing that keeps me away from God. Therefore, that's when I can be reconciled to God. My sins are washed away. And that's when I first have fellowship with God. I'm reconciled to God. See, when, when I sin, whenever that occurs, that first sin, I lose fellowship with God. But then, when I'm baptized into His death, then His blood erases that sin, brings us back together, and we're reconciled. But that's not the end of the story. Verses 22 and 23 say... <clears throat> After he says, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Notice the next word. If. See, the story's not over. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. If. See, staying reconciled to God is conditional. That's why he put the word if there. If. If you do what? Continue in the faith. That's what Paul wrote. 
if you continue in the faith, you stay reconciled to God. So what do I have to do? Continue in the faith. Remain obedient to the gospel. That's what the faith is, is the gospel. But what does that entail for me to do? Well, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9 says that I need to and must continue to confess my sins. If I do that, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse me of all sin. And so I don't lose my reconciliation. As long as I continue in the faith, as long as I'm obedient to the gospel, as long as I continue to confess my sins, His blood continues to cleanse me, and therefore I continue to have reconciliation with God. I continue to have peace with God. I continue to be in fellowship with God. And as long as I do that, He'll not impute sin to me. Back in Romans chapter 4, the apostle wrote this about imputing sin. In Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, <clears throat> quoting from Psalm 32, he says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. As long as I continue in the faith, as long as I continue to confess my sins, he does not impute sin to me. He continues to cleanse my sin and I continue to be reconciled to God. As long as I am reconciled to God, then He's going to present me as what? Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Holy has the idea of being separated from the world. The idea of being sanctified. The idea of being set apart. Blameless has the idea of being not sinless, but above blame, which is the, a, a phrase that he used to describe those in the church in the book of Ephesians. Above reproach, no charge can be laid to our account. See, God continues to cleanse us, and that continues... For us to be called holy and blameless and above reproach. As long as, if, I continue in the faith. As long as I continue to confess my sins. Then he continues to hold me up as holy and blameless and above reproach. I'm at peace with him. Why? Because his blood is continuing to wash away the one single thing that keeps me away from God's fellowship, and that's sin. That's sin. Certainly one of life's happiest moments, greatest moments, is when someone is reconciled to God through obeying the gospel. In Romans chapter 5, Paul would write these, verse, these words in the 5th chapter, verses 10 and 11. He wrote to them this, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That's one of the happiest moments. And we can continue to have that peace that fellowship, that closeness, if we continue to confess our sins. Continue in the faith. We'll stay reconciled to God. And in the end, He will hold us up as holy, blameless, and above reproach. What a wonderful uplifting, joyful paragraph that is in this book of Colossians. If we continue in the faith. But if we choose not to continue with the faith, if we don't confess our sins, then we lose that reconciliation. But as long as we have breath, as long as we have life, we can be reconciled to God. And if that's what you need this morning, we want you and encourage you to be reconciled to God. Let us stand and sing this song.